Our anime begins with our protagonist, Dr. Goru Amamiya, watching a DVD in a patient's room in his hospital. What DVD is he watching? Well, it's about his favorite idol. I, and no, she's not chat GPT incarnate, of B. Kamachi. Now, this might sound a little weird, and it gets even weirder when we find out that the idol in question is 16. <coughs> a nurse understandably asks him to stop being a weirdo. She follows up with the news that I is taking an absence from the spotlight due to bad health, and he is absolutely devastated to hear that, which again is pretty weird. The nurse then asks Guru what everyone watching is thinking. Dude, what's this obsession with this idol? Surprisingly, there's a somewhat wholesome explanation to it, and it has to do with an old patient of his named Serena. We are then taken to a flashback when Goru was treating a young patient named Serena, who was suffering from cancer. Now, Serena was a huge fan of the idol group, B. Kamachi, and her favorite member was, you guessed it, I. Serena was pretty talkative, and she mentioned a lot of things, including the possibility of being reincarnated as the child of a celebrity after her death. Keep that in mind. Now, Goru dismissed the idea, but he's not all grumps, as he later encouraged Sarina to try becoming an idol once she was discharged from the hospital. He even promised to become her fan and support her every step of the way. Wholesome stuff, right? Sarina, who had grown to really like Goru, asked him to marry her, but he declined because obviously he did. <coughs> However, he said that he would consider it when she turned 16, which we want to say was just him being nice, but it's weird all the same. Goru avoids another question from the nurse and was shocked to find Ai Hoshino, 20 weeks pregnant and accompanied by her agent, at his hospital. Overhearing a conversation about the father's identity being a secret, Goru was intrigued and determined to solve the mystery behind Ai's pregnancy. Dodging a question from the nurse, Goru heads to see his next patient, and to his shock, it was the idol Ai. Crazy, right? And it gets crazier because Ai isn't there for a routine checkup. She's 20 weeks pregnant. Goru steps outside to make sense of the whole thing, and he overhears her agent Ichigo asking Ai who the father is, to which she says that's a secret. The plot thickens. After examining Ai, they find out that Ai isn't just pregnant. She's pregnant with twins. Ichigo argues that Ai's idol career would be hurt if a word got that she was pregnant. Ai then asks for Goru's opinion, and he says it's a decision only she can take. Afterward, Goru headed to the waiting area to grab a drink. There, he overhears two men watching a news story about a marriage between two celebrities who were expecting. One of them says that if he died then and there, he'd be reborn as that celebrity's child. Again, keep this in mind. On the rooftop of the hospital now, Goru thinks about how self-obsessed idol fans are. Just then, Ai joins him, and they have a heartwarming conversation. She talks about why she's in the countryside and not in Tokyo, and Goru tells her about Serena. Ai says she has decided to keep her unborn children, and that she'll continue to be an idol, and she'll keep the pregnancy a secret. Ai then describes that lies are the most exquisite form of love, which is a pretty weird thing to say if you ask us. After this conversation, Goru decides that he will do everything to deliver Ai's children safely. The next day, Goru discusses with Ichigo how Ai will give birth to her babies, either through a C-section or sophrology, which worries Ichigo. Ai, however, is unworried, feels sure about her health, and is confident she'll have a smooth delivery. On the day that Ai was due to deliver her babies, Goru steps outside only to be confronted by a mysterious man. He somehow knows about Ai being hospitalized there. That's odd. Goru tries to ask the man where he got his information from and if he's related to Ai, but the man quickly runs away. Goru chases after him, which leads them to a cliffside near the mountains. Unfortunately for Goru, he gets pushed off a cliff to his death following the Ned Stark example of protagonists just up and dying. As Goru's soul leaves his body, he remembers Serena's words about being reborn as the child of a celebrity. So remember that stuff about being reincarnated as a celebrity's child? Yeah, Goru is kind of reborn as one of Ai's twins. Yes, we know. That's wild. His name is now Aquamarine, or Aqua for short. What's even more surprising is that Goru, now Aqua, has all of his memories intact, and as a former doctor, he's determined to unravel the mystery behind it. But for now, Aqua is happy living life to the fullest with Ai by his side. With the introduction of Aqua's twin sister, Ruby, they are a pretty happy family. 
As Ai lovingly cradles her children, Ichigo and his wife Miyako visit them. Ichigo proposes that Ai return to the idol scene, but there's a catch. Her children can't be known to the public. As a devoted mother, Ai is torn between her passion for singing and her love for her kids. That evening, Miyako reluctantly agrees to look after Aqua and Ruby. While they're together, Aqua switches on the TV and catches his mother almost messing up during an interview where she discloses that she had a baby. Shortly after, the musical group B. Kamachi comes on, and Aqua watches with the same disturbing interest. He then concludes that being killed by a deranged fan of his now mother maybe wasn't such a bad thing. Um, look for the positive in every situation, we guess. Ruby also sees their mother on TV and is stunned at her performance. Aqua then reveals that Ruby is also a reincarnated individual. He found this out after he caught her engaged in a heated online argument with some fans using their mother's phone. Yeah, that's idle fan behavior, all right. Now, the reason Ai's stalker killed Goru was because he was upset that Ai had lied to her fans about her pregnancy. One day, Ai had to leave to attend to her idle duties with Ichigo, leaving Miyako in charge of babysitting her twins again. Babysitting sucks, and Miyako was not pleased about having to look after these kids. In an attempt to make some money, Miyako decides she's going to expose the existence of the twins. But then, Aqua decides she's had enough of Miyako's nonsense. She claims she's a divine messenger, sent to stop her. At first, Miyako thought it was some kind of prank, but then Ruby also joined in with Aqua's facade. Now get a load of this. Ruby claims that the god of entertainment had chosen Ai, and that Aqua and Ruby were Destiny's children. If Miyako were to interfere with Destiny, she would perish. This revelation made Miyako feel remorseful and tearful. Ruby then asked her to protect them and keep their ability to speak a secret. Miyako believed it after hearing that a second marriage to a handsome actor was possible. And she promised to keep their secret safe. So Aqua turns to Ruby and goes, Were you an actress in your past life or something? But Ruby's all like, Nah, not me. I grew up in a pretty weird place, though. Aqua tells her that she's got some serious talent. She should consider getting into showbiz. And that gets Ruby thinking about what she wants to do with her life. One night, Aqua thinks the way Ruby talks about I is just like Serena. Ruby, as she heads to her bed, reveals in her thoughts that she indeed had been Serena in her previous life. Boom. Plot twist. So, B. Komachi is back, but they're not exactly rolling in dough. I's pretty bummed about it, and Miyako chimes in with some thoughts on the challenges of working with a small talent agency. But being the supermom that she is, I's determined to earn more cash for her kiddos' futures. She pieces out, leaving Aqua and Ruby to chat about how much money idols make and how that money gets divvied up. They're pretty ticked off, and they vent to Miyako. She tells them about the tough life of idols who go solo and don't make it big. They often have to take on jobs like waitressing at swanky bars or being hostesses in fancy areas like Minato. Yikes! So, after finishing up a lesson, I decides to do a little ego surfing and stumbles upon a fan's comment about her fake smile. Ouch! But later on, the twins sweet-talk Miyako into getting them tickets to Ai's mini-concert, where they all watch her and her group perform. While she's singing her heart out, Ai starts thinking about how she's always tried to create this perfect version of herself to please everyone. It's a lot of pressure, you know? But then, out of nowhere, the twins start cheering like crazy and draw a ton of attention to themselves. Ai can't help but smile and feel so proud of them. It's the cutest thing ever. And get this... Their reaction goes viral, with over 2 million views on a video. As I scrolls through the comments, she sees the same fan who dissed her smile now praising it. Can you believe it? Talk about a total turnaround. Fast forward a whole year later, and the twins can walk and talk like little pros. And during that time, ai has been busy stacking up a bunch of new jobs. Her latest gig? A minor role in a TV drama series. So, at the movie set, the twins were blown away by director Taishi's appearance. Later on, Aqua bumps into Taishi and is pretty impressed with Aqua's vocabulary skills. Taishi gave Aqua his business card and showed interest in him, but Aqua says he'd rather his mom get the offers. Taishi explains that the entertainment biz is tough with three types of actors, the main ones, natural talents, and newcomers. They watched Ai's performance, and Taishi thought it was average, but at least it got some attention. Later that night, Ai and her kids watched the show. 
but they were disappointed because she only had a small scene. Aqua hit up Taishi to find out why, and apparently the lead actress's agency cut back on Ai's scenes because she was too attractive. But get this, Taishi still wants Ai to be in his next film. The catch is that Aqua has to be in it too. Aqua thought his sister would be better for the role, but Taishi said he had to be in it if he wanted Ai to get the role. Later on, Ruby throws a fit because she couldn't get cozy with Ai due to conflicting filming schedules with Aqua. In the same room, a little girl scolds Ruby for her rude behavior and says her name is Kana Arima. It turns out that Kana is a super talented actor, and she complains about Aya being added to the film last minute. As she heads out, Kana calls Ai a talentless fraud who only got the gig because of nepotism, leaving the twins thinking she's a tool. And if somebody called my mama a fraud, I'd hate her guts too. So on set, Aqua and Kana are playing the role of these weird kids who greet the main character when they get to this village in the movie. Aqua's trying to impress Taishi by acting all creepy, but when Taishi calls cut, Kana's like, what the heck? Now she's jealous because Aqua's acting gave her goosebumps and she didn't think she was as good as him. Kana wants to do the retake, but Taishi likes the take, so he declines. Kana proceeds to have a meltdown because she feels like she didn't measure up to Aqua. Take that, loser. Later on, Taishi talks to Aqua about what happened. He tells Aqua that being a good actor means being able to communicate well and having a big ego at a young age could mess up your acting career. But Aqua tells him he doesn't want to be an actor. As Kana drives home, she spots Aqua's name on the script and decides she won't let him outshine her next time. Fast forward three years, Taishi's flick was a smash hit and he even got nominated for an award. I, who played the lead role, became super popular and started getting gigs left and right. An important note here is that Aqua's old dead body, the one that was pushed off a cliff, is still undiscovered. In preschool, Aqua asks Ruby about her past life, but Ruby dodges the question and fibs to avoid getting judged for dying young. When dance class rolls around, Ruby freaks out and bolts. Aqua catches up to her and learns that Ruby thinks she sucks at dancing because she used to have problems moving around as Serena. We're not crying, you are. So Ruby joined her mom for some dance practice and she noticed that I was doing a move wrong. Her mom was impressed that she remembered something like that and praised her for it. But when Ruby tried to do the move herself, she fell flat on her bum. I told her that it was like she was always on the verge of falling. Ouch! But then I tried to lift her spirits, and Ruby remembered how in her previous life she was stuck in bed, unable to move. All she could do was watch her mom dance and hope that she could move like her someday. So she decided to give it her all and started practicing. Little did she know, Aqua was secretly watching and taking notes. Damn it, why is this show suddenly so wholesome? Then one day, I overhears the twins talking about who their father is. Feeling sad that they are growing up without a father figure, she contacts the twins' father, asking if he'd like to see their children. Meanwhile, Ai's popularity as a TV drama star and idol had increased, and Ichigo was having the time of his life. Bikamachi was scheduled to perform at the Tokyo Dome, which was one of Ichigo's biggest dreams. However, we cut to Ai's internally monologuing, and she confesses that she's a liar and sometimes can't distinguish whether the emotions she portrays are genuine or not. A brief flashback depicts Aya being first scouted by Ichigo, with Ichigo persuading her to accept his offer, claiming that lying is an essential talent in the idol field. Anime or real life show business is a sketchy business. Okay, so one day this person comes to visit Ai at her place and brings her some flowers. They congratulate her and ask how her twins are doing. But then, out of nowhere, the person stabs Ai in the stomach. They start saying how they lied to her and her fans. Despite being injured, Ai goes on this rant about how lying is a form of love for her as an idol. This leaves the attacker confused, and Ai realizes that he's a man named Ryosuke, one of her regulars at those handshake events. Ryosuke freaks out and runs away while Aqua stumbles upon his mom and is horrified. He calls an ambulance for her. As Ai is bleeding out and her life slips away, she tells her kids how much she loves them, and how happy she is that of all the lies she ever told... This wasn't one of them. Yeah, I can't do this anymore. I don't have enough tissues. A few days after I was killed, they announced that the person who did it tried to kill themselves and ended up dying in the hospital. Fans were heartbroken over I's death, but the larger public was pretty Twitter toxic about it. Ruby was really upset by how people were being so harsh about it all. 
She thought it was pretty heartless and mean. People suck sometimes. After Ai's death, the news coverage dies down, and Ichigo and Miyako decide to adopt the twins. At their mother's funeral, Ruby shares that Ai told her she has what it takes to become an idol, but Aqua warns her about the dark side of that lifestyle. Meanwhile, Aqua is struggling to find a reason to keep going without Ai Ai. Then he realizes that Ryosuke is the same guy who killed him in his past life. Aqua wonders how Ryosuke found Ai's location and suspects that his father might have informed Ryosuke. Fueled by anger, Aqua vows to take revenge on his father with his own hands. And now it's a murder mystery? What even is this show? Aqua then goes to Taishi and asks him to raise him. Taishi's pretty shocked, but he agrees. Fast forward a few years, and now Aqua and Ruby are teenagers. And Aqua's all about that revenge life, and he's ready to start hunting down his dad. After the credits, there's a clip of A.E. filming the twins' first birthday and talking about their future while they snooze in her arms. Heartbreaking stuff. The episode opens with the news that an advertisement for becoming an idol was aired, and Ruby was one of the 136,114 applicants. See? Ruby dreams of becoming an idol and following in her mother's footsteps. Aqua, however, thinks she should focus on studying for her high school entrance exam. Thanks for the support, bro. He talks about all the downsides of being an idol. But Ruby is hell-bent on being an idol, and Aqua decides to stop arguing and heads over to meet Taishi. Ruby noticed that Aqua had changed a lot since their mother died. She thinks of how he used to be so friendly, but now he seemed distant and didn't show a lot of emotions, if any at all. Also, Ichigo had lost control of his company, and his wife, Miyako, was the boss now. Girl power for the win! Plus, they stopped making idol stuff since Bikomachi broke up after I died. Instead, they focus on famous internet personalities. Now, it's not like Miyako wouldn't love to start an idol division again. It's just impossible to rekindle what they once had ever since I, Yimgi, died. Just then, Ruby gets a phone call about her audition and finds out that she didn't pass. She's devastated about the whole thing. But then, it turns out that Aqua tricked her by pretending to be the person announcing the results. It also turns out that Ruby was selected, so he also sent a message to the people who wanted to hire Ruby, saying she was not interested. What a supportive brother. Aqua and Taishi did all of this in a small studio. The director thinks Aqua did a good job pretending, and Taishi says that he thinks Ruby has a lot of talent as an idol. But Aqua still doesn't want her to become one like I because he wants her to live a happy life. We get the motivation, but that's messed up, man. However, that isn't the end of Ruby's idol career, as she is approached by an underground idol. Aqua and Miyako are worried about this whole thing. Miyako understands Aqua's concerns, but she wants to support Ruby's dream. Aqua trusts no one. So he pretends to be a talent agent to gather information about the underground idol scene by scouting out a girl named Lala. Undercover as an agent? Now that's badass. At the Strawberry Production Company, Miyako and Aqua are present with Lala. Aqua asks Lala some questions about her current idol company and her contract terms. Lala proceeds to tell them disturbing information about the lead singer and their manager. Later, Miyako and Aqua discuss what they have learned and how it relates to the rumors they've heard. This only strengthens Aqua's determination to protect Ruby from becoming an idol, and especially from getting involved in something as sketchy as this. Before Ruby's audition for the underground idol group, Miyako asks if she is going to become an idol, despite the challenges that come with it. But Ruby remains as determined as Rocky, climbing those stairs, and says she's going to the audition. Miyako then has no choice but to offer Ruby a spot in their idol group instead. Ruby is over the moon and agrees, and Miyako has her sign official contracts with the production company to become an idol. Aqua goes to Taishi's house and tells him that he wants to become an idol, while helping him with his job as a director. Taishi asks Aqua if he wants to become an actor, too, but Aqua says he prefers studying other things. Aqua is also still looking for his father, who he thinks caused his mother's death. Taishi says he thinks Aqua would make a great actor and gives him some advice, but Taishi's mother keeps interrupting them, much to his annoyance. She means well, though, so we can't be mad at her. Aqua and Ruby apply for high school and meet Kana after their interviews. Aqua doesn't recognize Kana at first, but Ruby reminds him of her special ability and he remembers who she is. Kana is happy to see Aqua and asks him if he applied for the acting department. 
The episode ends with her being surprised to hear that he applied for general studies, with Ruby being the one that applied for the acting department instead. Makes sense when you think about it, though. Aqua and Ruby meet Kana at Yodo High School and talk about the programs they applied for. Aqua then leaves for Taishi's home, and Kana followed him because she wants to catch up. Aqua then invites Kana to Taishi's home, where they talk about Aqua's work in the entertainment industry since they last met. During dinner, Kana asks Taishi if he has any videos of Aqua acting. Aqua, however, does not want to share any because he doesn't think he's any good as an actor. Oh, he's shy. Kana suggests Aqua act on a project she was working on, but Aqua says he's not interested. Kana explained that the project was a drama based on a manga that Aqua happened to like and that the producer was Messiah, someone she knew. Internally, Aqua thinks about how he found three cell phones that belonged to Ai after she died. One of the phones was used by Ai before she got pregnant. It took Aqua four long years to figure out that phone's passcode, but eventually he unlocked it. Inside, he discovered that I had contacts in the entertainment industry, including someone named Messiah, a lead. Aqua agrees to an offer from Kana and contacts Messiah, who gives him the role of the bad guy on a TV show. Ruby was happy to find out that Aqua would be in a TV show because she thought he was doing it for I. This happiness turned to disappointment fast. When Ruby and Miyako watched the show, they were surprised by just how bad the acting was. Aqua later met Kana, who told him that the show wasn't supposed to be good and that it was made for women who like good-looking men. Trash TV, basically. They didn't care if the actors were good at acting or not. However, to ensure that not everyone on set was a total bum, they hired Kana to make the show a bit better. But Kana didn't want to make the other actors look bad, so she holds back on her acting. Kana explains that since the goal of the TV show is to just make money, it can't be good. Even the person who created the manga was disappointed when she saw it. However, everyone working on the show is trying their best to make it successful. And so Kana wants to make the show at least watchable, even if it means people might not think highly of her. That's pretty noble right there. Kana tells Aqua he thinks that when she was a child, she acted selfishly. And that caused people to stop liking her as she got older. She had been slowly trying to rebuild her reputation in the acting industry. Kana tells Aqua that they have a very tight schedule to make the show and gives him his part of the script. She trusts in his acting skills and asks him to help make the show good. Bonding, perhaps? Aqua, after reviewing the show and its script by himself, thinks the production crew and Kana did a great job in making the show enjoyable and making it look good. That's like getting praise from The Undertaker. On the day of filming, Kana tells Aqua that they only have one chance to practice at the filming location because of time restraints. Aqua meets Melt Narushima, the male lead of the show, but he doesn't pay much attention to Aqua. Not that Aqua cares. Aqua also meets Messiah and manages to get a DNA sample from his cigarette butt. After the practice run, Kana tells Aqua that she thinks he's a great actor and she's happy that someone else understands the struggles of the industry. Kana is excited because it's been 10 years since she had a lead role and she wants to give it her all. She's glad that people are recognizing her talent. The episode opens with Aqua scouting the set where his next scene is to be shot with precision that can only be described as Sherlock Holmes meets Leonardo DiCaprio. The scene then cuts to Kana being on camera with the crew telling her that the mic, camera, and lights are ready. We are then shown Kana monologuing to herself. She mentions how growing up, everyone thought she was a total genius, and she used to be pretty popular. She refers to it as her golden age. But then she talks about how her prime was short-lived. She talks about the toxic nature of fandom culture and how quickly they move on to the next thing. She also questions whether maybe it was a lack of talent and effort on her part. Either way, she reckons she passed her prime at some point in elementary school. Since then, she's been known online as a washed-out child actress. But now, she has the star opportunity she's been waiting for, and she's ready to do whatever it takes to make it work. She then says how she knows that this isn't the most glorious role in the world. After all, the first four episodes had bombed pretty hard. But this upcoming part was one of the best scenes from the original story, and she's determined to do everything she can to make this work. 
the scene in question is when the protagonist of the show and her stalker finally come face to face and a girl that has felt unloved and alone her entire life is finally protected. She mentions how that scene from the manga always makes her cry and she's going to use that to make this a performance to remember. One small problem with that. Her counterpart, Melt, is, let's say, a limited actor. Still, she's determined to get in sync with him and make this work. But to her horror, she realizes this guy isn't even serviceable as an actor. To make things even worse, the director and crew seem to be fine with it all. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, Aqua walks onto the scene and, get this, starts improvising. We see him talk about himself not being the most talented actor in the world, but how he's going to use everything at his disposal to be like I. Damn. So how does he do this? Well, he goes up and tells Melt that he's ugly, of course. This makes Melt angry, causing him to grab Aqua's shirt. Meanwhile, Kana stands there shocked, because Aqua has just used his smarts to recreate the exact panel from the manga. Aqua thinks about how this is one of the most important scenes from the manga, and how he's always been good at understanding stories. He set this entire moment up so that Kana can go all out and steal the show. Kana recognizes this and gets into character immediately. Aqua pulls out a knife and charges at Kana, proclaiming she isn't worth saving. Melt knocks the knife out of his hand and pushes him away. And suddenly the scene is electric. Aqua claims that people should know there is nothing good waiting for anyone in life, and people should know their place. And that's when Kana bursts into tears and exclaims that life does have meaning, and there is light ahead. The scene is an absolute banger. Afterward, Aqua tells Melt that acting with emotions is the best kind of acting. The director talks about how despite having to change things up, this is great for the show. We cut to the writer of the manga they are adapting, tuning in to the latest episode of the show. All her friends say that they stopped watching because the show is awful, and she says she knows that. But as she watches the scene that Aqua, Melt, and Kana filmed, she tears up and says she's thankful that an adaptation of her work exists. Most people that were excited about the show had stopped watching it, but hardcore fans of the show appreciated just how good the last episode was. Later at the wrap dinner for the show, Kana asks Aqua if he has a girlfriend, to which he replies, no, and she blushes. Interesting. The writer of the manga then comes up to her and tells her that her acting was what made the last episode so good, though she wishes it could have been better sooner. Messiah comes up to Aqua and says that while the show was a failure, the last episode received great reviews, and since the goal was to propel new young talent onto the scene, it was an overall success. Meanwhile, Aqua thinks about how there was no match between his and Messiah's DNA, so that's one less culprit. However, Messiah points out how similar Aqua looks to I, and mentions he knows who she was seeing. Aqua asks, and he makes him a deal. He'll tell him if he participates in a reality dating show. Later, Aqua and Ruby are on their way to the first day of U2 Hue School. Before they leave, they say goodbye to a picture of their mother. Come on, man, that's enough to make a grown man cry. The grown man is me. I'm crying. After the entrance ceremony, they are greeted by Kana, who goes to the same school. She mentions how the school is flexible with schedules, but you'll be held back if you have bad grades. Plus, what's different about this school is that everyone here is a celebrity of some sort. As Ruby walks into class, she's overwhelmed by how good-looking everyone is. As she sits down, she turns to her right and sees a gorgeous girl staring back at her. The two gawk over how pretty the other person is for a bit before introducing themselves. The girl is Minami, a model with a fake accent, and Ruby is now recounting all of this to Aqua, who is just happy she made a friend. She then asks Aqua if he's made any friends, to which he snaps back that it's harder for guys to make friends and that it'll take time and he's not like a complete loner or anything. Ruby feels bad for him and asks Minami to be his friend too. But Aqua tells her to just worry about herself. He then mentions that Frill Shiranui is in her class, and Ruby has a meltdown over how much she adores her and thinks she's just the best. Just then, Frill is walking by, and Aqua just walks up to her and introduces Ruby. She recognizes him from Mild Today and recognizes Minami from a magazine cover, but doesn't recognize Ruby because, well, she's not doing anything. The next scene is Ruby practically begging Miemon to make her an idol. Miyamon says she can't just make an idol group like that. She needs cute girls, but Ruby says that she'll get bullied because she's seen as a commoner. Aqua then pitches the idea of hiring Kana as an idol, as she is a freelancer and has a cute face. So he thinks she's cute? Very interesting. 
If you enjoyed the video, be sure to slap the like button gently with a wrench and kick the bell notification.